Thanks, Emma. Good evening, and thank you all for joining us tonight for tonight's Nat Talk, Understanding Bird Behavior with Dr. Wenfei Tong. I'm Judy Gradwell, President and CEO of the San Diego Natural History Museum. And as we look back at the past six months uh, since we closed our building in Balboa Park, it's clear that we are so much more than what is inside of our walls. In the field, our scientists are braving the heat to survey for our wandering skippers, which are butterflies of conservation concern. And I'm happy to report that they found several areas that appear to be teeming with butterflies. In other excellent conservation news, some of you may have followed the story of our red-legged frog translocation from Baja, California into San Diego. And we've just gotten word, actually got another email tonight that many of the eggs that we so gingerly transported are now thriving froglets. Meanwhile, our membership department recently implemented a new online series of member meetups. And in these interactive Q and A's, you can meet museum staff and get a view of the work that goes on behind the scenes. The next meetup is with our curator of botany, John Redman, which will be a real treat. Uh, and that's on Friday, October 9th. You can ask him all your burning plant questions. You just need to sign up. Um, you just need to sign up for a membership if you don't have one. In our education department, the staff is just about to launch a roster of online programming that teachers and caregivers will use to bring natural history into the classroom or home. And of course, none of these activities would, could take place without your support. The tickets you purchase tonight, your donations and your Facebook shares all help our mission to thrive during this time and we thank you mightily. So on to tonight's talk. The 2019-2020 season of Nat Talks is made possible by presenting sponsor the Downing Family Foundation and media partner KPBS, the public media station serving San Diego and Imperial counties. Tonight's speaker is Dr. Wenfei Tong. Wenfei is a biologist with a passion for understanding and conserving the natural world, who enjoys sharing her love of birds and biology through her paintings, photography, teaching, and writing. She grew up in Singapore where she started birding at 12. She first got hooked on field biology as an undergraduate at Princeton and Oxford and has a PhD in evolutionary biology from Harvard where she is a research associate. She has taught at universities of Montana and Alaska Anchorage where she wrote her first book, Bird Love. She has guided natural history tours in Tanzania, the Galapagos and Montana where she owns a tour company and takes visitors birding on horseback. And uh, I understand she's in Montana speaking to us tonight. So welcome, Wen Fei. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for that lovely introduction, Judy. And thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. It's really exciting to share my love of birds and to just tell you a bit about why I got interested in bird watching and why I wrote these two books. If I can start the slideshow. There we go. So this is a mangrove pitter, and it's one of my favorite birds. I should say that all the pictures, all the photographs and illustrations in this talk are mine, because we, we've got a copyright issue with the books being, with, with the talks being broadcast and left on Facebook. So I thought it would be easier just to use my own things and then not have to worry about the publishers. And so this is just an example of one of the things I love about bird watching, which is that there's always this feeling of being on a slight hunt for something. And this bird is very, very shy and secretive, even though it's so beautiful and colorful. And so I got a big kick out of looking for this bird. That's one element of bird watching, which is a lot of fun if you do like to spend time outdoors, but you want a little more excitement than you would typically experience just wandering around and not knowing what you're looking at. And the other thing that birds mean a lot to me for and have for a long time is that I've grown up really thinking a lot about the similarities between humans and other species. And so this is a slide from the last bit of my acknowledgements in my PhD talk. And it's traditional for students to acknowledge all the people and thank all the people that helped them. And usually people have photographs, but I didn't really have photographs of people because I spend all my time photographing animals. So what I did was draw all the people that I wanted to thank as animals that I associated them with. And I just wanted to mention the satin bowbird on the top left corner, which is one of the professors who really inspired me a lot because 
he wasn't just a, he, he passed away last year, Henry Hall, but he wasn't just a fantastic scientist with a real thirst for understanding natural history. And you, you could go for a walk in the woods with him and he would tell you every single tree and every single bird and little spider you were seeing. But he also had a wonderful creative knack with both math ma mathematics and art. So he, one of his books is The Adaptive Geometry of Trees. And I drew him as a satin bowerbird because he's so, he's an artist as well, he was an artist. And he would do all these terrific little renditions. He, he carved little bits, little animals out of driftwood and took them to the Grand Canyon and then photographed them and set up things for K through 12 education, looking at his little wooden animals going, hey, I could go on about Henry for ages, but let me switch to satin bower birds. Uh, these are fascinating birds because they build these architectural structures and they essentially collect a lot of beautiful belongings, including especially blue, which matches their feathers. So they seem to have a preference for blue. And if they can't find enough blue objects like berries, they'll find blue bottle caps from tourists. And they'll line the, the, the surroundings of their bower with these lovely collections of objects, like, like a museum curator or an, a, an interior designer or something would do. And they use that whole structure to lure females in. And the idea is it's not a nest at all. This is just a way to attract females. And there've been wonderful experiments where people look at this, the intelligence of the male bower bird, not just how beautiful his structures are or how shiny his plumage is, but how good he is at problem solving. And it turns out that the males that are better at problem solving are the ones that get more females attracted to the nest. So that's just an example of the fun experiments that I try to talk about in my book, as well as what birds mean to me. Uh, some other things that they mean to me, which I hope to get across in the books is that they symbolize the seasons a lot and they sort of root me all the time. So I, I'm starting to sound like a religious proselytizer, but here's a yellow warbler that I took a photo of just north of Boston, Massachusetts. And so one thing they do is herald spring and I found them a great solace and comfort during the pandemic because I was in New York City at that time. And even in the middle of New York, actually in the middle of a big city like Singapore, where I grew up, you can find birds everywhere and you can hear them. And so these are little sketches that I did to, to cheer myself up during this, this spring during the pandemic, because I would go take my dog in the, for a walk in the park every day and see all these robins building their nests or this Carolina wren that would be singing in exactly the same spot every morning. And so these birds became very much like neighbors. And I find that happens almost everywhere I go. And that's a really fun and enjoyable aspect of getting to know the birds wherever you are, especially in your backyard. So in both books, I try to talk not just about very exotic birds, which I will have in this talk as well, but birds that everyone should be familiar with in their backyards, wherever in the world they live. Oh, so that's the two books, just so you have a search image. And since most of this audience, I think, is from San Diego, I thought I would share some of the photographs that I took in San Diego about 10 years ago, I realize now. It's the last time I visited. And these are, I think, all taken in Oceanside. So here's a brown pelican. And I'll come back to brown pelicans again later in the talk. But one of the things I try to bring out in understanding bird behavior is the fact that a lot of people in biology now are starting to have the ability to study birds as individuals. And I really enjoyed this pelican because he or she was having a terrific time cleaning, cleaning itself and sort of just splashing in the water happily. And you, you can see it's so expressive, this bird. It looked so pleased with itself, just, just splashing its wings in the water. And I'm, I'm sure it was having fun. So there's a lot of, borderline anthropomorphic language that I use in the book. And I think that's intentional because personally, I don't see a great difference between humans and other species. And a lot of the hormones and the emotions that we feel as a result of those hormones are very deeply conserved evolutionarily. So I think there's a good scientific reason for identifying strongly with 
other species, such as birds. This is a says Phoebe that I saw in the same beat um, on Oceanside. And I put it here because I recently went up a mountain in Montana and saw a pair of says Phoebes right at the top of that mountain. I, I, don't, I don't know exactly what they were doing, but they looked like they were flying at each other and having a little disagreement. And so it's just terrific to me that the same bird can be living and breeding all the way in San Diego on the, near the coast, as well as on the mountaintop in Montana. And a uh, closely related bird, the black phoebe, also on the same beach. I, this is slightly corny, but I put the slide in to remind myself that even though I use a lot of anthropomorphic language and my whole purpose is to get people to identify with birds, I do want to stress that there's nothing moral about, or oh, there, there are no moral precepts to take from anything I talk about or any of the examples I use. So the, the point is that evolution and nature in general are completely amoral. There's, there isn't a should or shouldn't involved in, in any of the examples I use. You'll, you'll see why I'm saying this because it, things get a bit gory. Uh, so, so just to start, the last thing I wanted to bring up to people's minds is because I'm trained as an evolutionary biologist, and this is a photograph I took in northern Kenya with Mount Kenya in the background, and it's where I first started being a field biologist studying zebras, actually, in this place, this field centre called Impala. And in the foreground, you've got a lot of little nests in the acacia tree. So one of the things I'd like everyone to keep in mind is just this idea that we share a very deep evolutionary history with all the birds that I'll talk about or in the books. And so every time you ask questions about why there's such a diversity of behaviors and why birds behave the way they do, it does tell us something about our own behavior and why that evolved as well. And so here, for instance, you can ask why these social, gray cat social weavers are nesting in a group as opposed to other birds which nest singly, don't, don't build their nests in clumps. And I, I answer that question, I think at least one of the books. So I'll just zoom in on one of these nests to give you an idea of what the bird looks like. It's, it's the, what you call a cooperative breeder. So we actually see evidence of members from previous clutches, so grown up children coming back to help the parents with these nests. And here's another nest that I found in, that I used to study in Africa. Uh, this is from Zambia, where I did a lot of my postdoc work, but I just wanted to take a moment for you to look for the nest in this photograph. And obviously it's dead smack in the center, but the fantastic thing about this nest is you'll notice that it's built from living grass. And so I'll cut to a photograph of an aerial view of the nest so you can see what it looks like from the inside. It's a nest of a very, very drab little brown job bird called the rattling cysticula. And cysticulas are specific to the old world, but they're, they're the sort of bird you would just walk past and unless you were a really keen birder, you would not want to be trying to ID this thing because really cysticulas are best ID from their, from their songs. They, they have fantastic names. They're rattling cysticulas, croaking cysticulas, sissifling cysticulas, um, all sorts of funny names. But anyway, this is what the nest looks like from above. So you can see that it's been, the bird has basically stuck the growing grass stems together from within using bits of spider silk and various insect cocoon silks, and then lined it with its feathers. And so these are fascinating nests to look for because they're really hard to find. And we had to get a lot of local children to help us find them. So I thought one, one of the things the books does is to try and explore the diversity of behaviors, including architectural structures that birds are capable of building, such as these nests, all the way to the classic bird nest that we see from something like the American robin. And here's a lovely behavior that the robin's performing where it's essentially taking a little poo packet from its chicks and it's about to fly out of the nest with that. And, but a lot of birds do that to keep the nests clean. I do have, I think, some examples of other ways in which birds keep the nest clean, but also have the chicks deter predators by shooting nasty substances at them or shooting their poo at predators, 
which I always find entertaining as well. Um, another aspect of nesting, of course, is finding the nest holes. So this is another sketch I did in the spring when I was watching this pair of wood ducks looking for a new hole. And on the first line, you've got the female on the left and the very colourful, gaudy male on the right. She's being mobbed by a starling. So one of the other behaviours I talk about is this mobbing behaviour, which is where birds attack and some, something that they consider a source of danger. And I just thought it was fascinating watching these birds interact in this large tree because all its nest, all the existing cavities in this tree were already occupied by starlings. And this female wood duck really liked this tree, but it's like she couldn't find any available real estate. It reminds me of all the New Yorkers or whatever fleeing the big cities and looking for somewhere to put down roots in more rural places like Missoula, Montana. And gosh, the housing market is crazy right now. So, so she, she was looking and looking and looking at all these tree holes and the poor male was waiting, but no, no luck, I think, at least while I was watching them. So there's nests where in the pairs look for the nest together, but there's also nests as a form of courtship. And here's a male weaver also in Zambia, who has built a nest as part of a way to get a female interested. And the females will come and inspect these potential holes, these potential places to rear their chicks. And if they're not satisfied, they sometimes tear them up, which is not such great fun for the male. But this, this one looks quite good. So I think he ended up with someone. Of course, there are also lots of other ways that birds choose mates. So here's a pair of barn swallows. And I took this photo in Montana as well. So you'll notice that the male who's in front is very reddish in, on his belly and his breast. And whereas if you look at barn swallows in Australia or Asia or Europe, you find that they tend to be much paler. They're almost snowy white, gleaming white in front. And the barn swallows are very easily distinguished from other swallows because they have these beautiful long tail streamers. So there was an experiment done a few decades ago where people snipped off the tail ends of these tail feathers on males and then glued them back on and used that to artificially lengthen or shorten the tails. And then they had a control as well, which had the same length tail. And they looked at how many children those males had. And they found that if the males had artificially longer tails, they had the most children. So they were the sexiest males. And so this is the argument for why you have what we call sexual selection for very extreme characteristics, such as extremely long tail feathers, which are not very aerodynamically sensible. So it makes it harder for the bird to maneuver to catch insects or escape from predators or something. But it makes him sexier and it gives him more children. What was fun about this is, I'll get back to trying to explain the difference between European barn swallows and North American barn swallows. People ex repeated this experiment in North America and they found that the females really didn't care about how long the male barn swallow tails were. So that left everyone scratching their heads. Right? It's like, there's this beautiful, elegant experiment and the females don't care who, which happens a lot in science actually. And they found out that it was really the color of the male's belly that the females liked. And so if you artificially apply rouge to a barn swallow male's front, chest front, he gets more offspring in North America, but the North American females don't seem to care so much about his tail feathers. And that explains or at least it's consistent with the geographic variation we see, whereas where in North America, you have males that are very reddish in front and have relatively short tails. Whereas in Europe, where the females like longer tails, but don't care about the color of the shirt front, they, they have longer tails and they're very white in front. Um, there's also, I try to cover a lot of, because for most birds, the males, such as the wood ducks and the barn swallows, are the showy ones and they do a lot of showing off to females. These are Wilson's phalaropes, which are a type of shorebird. And the more colorful, larger, slightly larger bird that's right in front is actually a female, whereas the other two behind her are male. And so this bird, as well as a few others, are examples of what's quite rare among birds, what we call in biology a sex role reversal. And so I try and talk about why in a very small number of species, you see larger, showier females that fight for the males and actually leave most of the parental care, most of the childcare to the males, and when that tends to occur. 
and this is just a close-up of a female Balibu. So she's she's definitely the more colourful one, and she'll fight off other females for access to males. On the other end of the spectrum, which is more of what we're familiar with, is all these dinosaur-like, very very competitive males. And so this is a dusky grouse that was male that was charging me, and they get really amped up on hormones in the summer. And I think this poor grouse ended up being run over because he would charge anything that came into his territory including cars probably. Uh, but the chickens are, the whole chicken order is just fascinating. And I did want to mention that birds are the only living dinosaurs. I'm sure most of you already know that, but this kind of encounter with birds as well as being charged by things like turkeys always makes me think of, it always reminds me of the fact that birds really are dinosaurs. If anyone keeps chickens, you probably feel this every day. This is a, sharp-tailed grouse display and so they're very closely related to prairie chickens and they have this fantastic coloured throat skin that they puff up and they actually spin in little pirouettes with their little sharp tails sticking up in the air and it's fascinating to watch these grouse lack because they do something called lacking which is a special behaviour where several males gather on a dancing ground and they display to females en masse and it's very easy for the females to then decide who they think is the most attractive male. So from, from, from the male's perspective, this is best for the, the male that gets all the matings, the most attractive male. But it's a very interesting mating system in the sense that it's a winner takes all situation. So either you're the most attractive male and you get 99% of the matings or you're on the periphery and you, no one's interested in you. And there's another very interesting experiment done. This is a black grouse, but same, same group of birds. This is a European example. And biologists did an experiment with these black grouse because they were wondering, okay, what causes this crazy skew in reproductive success where one male is the winner who takes it all? And they found that these female grouse actually follow fashions. So you can do an experiment where you put a lot of stuffed females around one male and you create a heartthrob, you, you turn him into the pop star of the night or the, the pop star of the season, because all the other females see that he's getting more attention. And that's one of the cues, one of the rules of thumb that they use to, to decide who to mate with, which I, is another brilliant ex experiment, I think. Um, and I just thought I would stick in a domestic chicken since this was actually taken in my parents' yard, in my parents' garden a few years ago. And the red jungle fowl, which is the ancestor of all domestic chickens, is from Malaysia, or from that sort of Southeast Asia area. And they're beautiful birds, so I just thought I'd stick this in there. Okay, um, cutting from courtship to, to what goes on after courtship, this is a very common backyard bird in Australia. It's called a superb very rare. And they're fascinating for lots of reasons. So they pop up in the books again and again. But what I've got them here for specifically is the male who's the showy one again, in this case, is displaying to a female with a little flower petal. And in this case, unlike the satin bowerbirds that like to choose colors that match their plumage, superb fairy wrens like complementary colors. So they tend to prefer yellow or orange to, to, to show off their beautiful blue feathers. And it turns out that these birds win the Guinness Book of Records for infidelity. So up to three quarters of the chicks in a given nest are not fathered by the male who's caring for them and who is bonded very closely to the female that, that is their mother. And so biologists were wondering when these extra pair copulations were taking place. And it looks like the females from radio tagging the female, the females are actually sneaking off just before dawn to whichever neighbor most attracted them and having a little extra pair liaison and then coming home. And because they're all doing it, all, and all the males are doing this too, it's a sort of Russian roulette situation. But what I found fascinating about this example is the males only display with flower petals to their neighbors. They don't do it to their long-term long partner. They just do it to, the, the ones who, whom they want to have an extra pair of copulation with. But the females make the ultimate judgment on that. 
I also talk, um, I'll, I'll cut from all the reproductive behavior, direct reproductive behavior and talk about bird song. So this is a Western meadowlark and it's one of my favorite, favorite songs because it evokes feelings of just freedom and grasslands and riding horses across open prairie. And I, one of the reasons I bring up bird song a lot is it is used for courtship as well as territorial behavior. But it's a fascinating example of culture in animals other than humans. And this is a white-throated sparrow, no, sorry, white-crowned sparrow. And I took this photo in San Diego as well on the same trip as I took the other bird, San Diego bird photos. But these North American sparrows are one of the best examples we have of different, different geographic accents, essentially. So males from a particular part of North America or even a particular part of California will sound, will have their own regional dialect and their songs will sound distinctly different from males in another place. And this is because these birds learn their songs from a tutor just as they're growing up. And it's very analogous to what, how human children learn language. If you miss this sort of sensitive period where they're most receptive to their native song, they won't ever learn it again. It, once they've passed that developmental period, which is a bit like children. If, if you don't learn a certain language at a particular age, you, it, it's very different from learning a language as a second language as an adult. Completely different parts of your brain are involved and things like that. Um, there's also a lot about social behavior outside of courtship and outside. So similarly to how I said the a lot of songbirds use song for ter territories. I thought I'd bring up ravens as an example of how individuals are so smart that they keep tabs on the relationships between other individuals. So it's already quite sophisticated to know what all your neighbors sound like and to sort of, you know, birds really like to explore, investigate. If you, if you do a playback, and some birders do this, to try and lure birds in. You, you play a song and that bird is especially keen to investigate because it knows that your phone or your, your playback device doesn't sound like one of the neighbors it's familiar with. So it's most birds are able to remember individuals based on their song. What's really cool about ravens is they don't just remember other individuals, they remember how those other individuals know each other, how strong their relationships are, and what kind of relationships they have. And we know this because ravens form these very strong monogamous pair bonds. And once they found a partner for life, they settle down on a territory and they defend that vigorously. Uh, but until that stage, until about five years or so, however long it takes them to find a partner, they go through a period of, this is a bit like humans going to bars or something to try and find a, trying to find a partner. They, they go through a lot of little friendships and they go through different stages of these budding friendships. And so it's not in the interests of a power couple of ravens who already have their territory to have other competitor, sort of strong long-term couples around because then they have to fight for, kill, fight for access to scavenge kills when they scavenge and things like that. So what they do is they keep tabs on these younger ravens. And if they see that there's a pair that's really starting to become very close, they sabotage them. They don't bother to sabotage the budding relationships of much younger, more casual couples. They, they specifically pick on the ones that are about to become the next power couples. And they, they go in and break it up if they see them building and cooing. I found that a really cool study. There's also less, well, more simple-minded birds that are very capable of having complicated relationships in their heads too. So these are vulturine guinea fowl. They're closely related to the helmeted guinea fowl that most people will be more familiar with. And they're more arid adapted. So these are birds that I saw a lot in Kenya, in the same place that I showed you that earlier photo of, with Mount Kenya in the background. And these birds tend to form flocks of about 60 individuals. And so you would think that within that flock of about 60, everyone just mills about and has no stronger relationships. But 
by tagging every individual bird, these biologists from the Max Planck found that they actually have little subclusters of relationships. So you have a couple of families that prefer to spend time together and they'll actually spend most of their time feeding and nest, roosting near each other within that group of 60 birds. So it's a bit like within your neighborhood, you might have a couple of families that you tend to spend more time with, even though you do a lot of things in the same area as all the people in the same neighborhood as you. There's also very sophisticated forms of social behavior with what we call cooperative breeders, which is what the superb fairy wrens in Australia do as well. These are acorn woodpeckers, which you have quite a few of in California, as well as in Arizona, bits of Mexico. And in certain parts of their range, acorn woodpeckers form these large groups, which breed together and also form acorn larders together, which they guard together. So what I've tried to draw here is a little cluster of acorn woodpeckers at one of their granaries, one of their granary trees, where they hammer bespoke custom made little holes for every acorn that they collect and then they jam it into the hole and that's their way of keeping the acorn fresh for the for over the winter and they'll have several trees if, if it's a big group and millions of acorns and the larger the group the better they can amass these larders as well as defend them against other groups rival groups and with this system, it's just fascinating because with the cooperation comes a lot of internal conflict as well, because you find that multiple females, multiple pairs share a single nest. And so even though they're cooperating to, to incubate the eggs and to raise the chicks and to guard their granaries, they also have a lot of conflict because it's in everyone's interest to have more chicks in a particular nest than the other people, then the other birds in the group. So females actually chucked each other's eggs out until they've started laying themselves, at which point they stop because they might chuck their own egg out by mistake. So there's a lot of conflict and there's a lot of internal disruption and destruction as well as the cooperation, which is a tension I find very interesting in multiple species. On a less sophisticated note, these Canada jays and closely related Siberian jays, which you get in Europe and Asia, also form cooperative breeding groups, but they're less, they're less complicated than what the acorn woodpeckers do. So here it's more the case of, uh, again, finding it hard to get any available real estate because everything's filled, all the territories are filled. And in those situations, young birds will stay behind, even though they're fully mature and sexually mature, they just can't find the territory. So they'll glom on to an existing pair and help them amass food for the winter and help them raise the next, sometimes help them raise the next batch of children. And they'll do this even with unrelated birds. Uh, in terms of childcare, I just thought I'd show these plovers because a lot of shorebirds have very, much, very high variation in who takes care of the children. And that's partly because the offspring, the chicks are so what we call precocial. They're, they're fluffy and they can run around within minutes sometimes of hatching. And so they're quite independent and they don't require a great deal of care. And as a result, the parents sometimes in some species will try to be the first to leave so that they just leave their partner as the single parent. And Biologists have found from looking at the sex ratio of the parents that whichever sex is rarer and therefore going to be in high demand and find it, going to find it easier to find a new partner is the one that's more likely to abscond. And in a lot of populations, this happens to be the female. And so since she's rarer, she's, it's going to be easier for her to find a new mate. She actually leaves first and then leaves the father to take care of the offspring and just finds another male and sets up, sets up home all over again with a new guy. But that varies from population to population, which is one of the themes that I try and bring up in the book, where we're getting to the point where instead of treating all birds from one species as a same, we're looking at population differences as well as individual differences. Uh, there's also the strategy of just dumping your children on another 
disappear altogether. So in this common meganza species, it's very common to see common megansas with about 20 ducklings. And that's not possible for one female common meganza to have laid all those eggs. But it's very commonly the case that other females have snuck a few of their eggs, extra eggs into her nest. And she ends up raising a huge flotilla of ducklings. And again, like with the pub plovers, these ducklings are quite independent. So the, the marginal cost of an extra duckling is relatively small. You don't, you don't see this so much with songbirds like robins or sparrows, because it's really expensive to raise a lot of naked, young, very, very helpless chicks. And that brings me to another strategy that parents have for dealing with, well, trying to maximize their reproductive output in the long term. So unlike things like robins and sparrows, where birds start incubating all their eggs at the same time so that everyone grows up at about the same age, a lot of birds of prey, such as these barn owls, will stagger the age of their children. And they do that by starting to incubate the moment their first egg is laid. And so you end up with this crazy size disparity. It's not, it's, life is not really, really not very fair for young, birds of prey. And in times of plenty, it's all hunky-dory because everyone there's enough food for everyone. But in times where there just isn't enough food to go around, it's very usual that the runts don't make it. And the, you could ask why the parents bother to lay extra eggs at all. One, one idea is they're hedging their beds in case there's more, there's enough food to raise more chicks that year. It's also hedging their bets because sometimes the first couple of eggs is addled and doesn't hatch, in which case the last few are insurance eggs. So they're really there just in case the, uh, the older ones don't make it. A slightly darker version of this is simplicide, which doesn't occur all the time in great blue herons, which is what I've drawn here, but it is what we call obligate. So in, in things like great egrets, which are closely related. So in something like a great egret, they almost always have twins and one of them never makes it because its sibling always kills it. So it's really conflict from in the nest from the start. So it's a good thing that humans don't do this since it would really be a nightmare right now with everyone staying at home a lot more. This is another it's an adult great blue heron, so I thought I'd cut from family life to another theme in the book, which is just finding food. And I took this photo in North California rather than Southern California, but it was fascinating to watch this bird because he was walking around in the long grass for a long time, and I couldn't figure out why a heron was so interested in the long grass. And then suddenly it came up with this ground squirrel and took it, flew it, to the water and drowned the squirrel repeatedly until, until it was dead and then flew off with it, which is how I got this photograph. And I had a really hard time swallowing it. But um, I spend quite a lot of time talking about different ways in which birds find food. And one of the themes that I try to talk about related to that, and this, this is an understanding bird behavior, is the idea of convergent evolution. So, similar or the same solutions to a common evolutionary problem that evolve independently. So on the left here, we've got birds that I grew up with that are called sunbirds, uh, although these are two African species. And then on the right, you've got hummingbirds, which all of everyone in North America or, or the New World will find much more familiar. And both groups are nectar feeders and they're very small and they fly very fast and they're extremely colorful and extremely beautiful. But what's fascinating is they've independently, completely independently evolved to eat sugar. And one of my friends figured out how hummingbirds taste sugar. So it's quite rare actually for birds to feed exclusively on carbohydrates like sugar. Most birds feed on either insects or, or seeds. And so Normally, to, to, find, to feed on something, you've got to find it rewarding. It's sort of why we find salt and fat so, 
so exciting and why we tend to bring on hamburgers is because we've evolved to find those tastes very, very palatable. And so she had this question of how did hummingbirds evolve to taste sweet things and like sweet things? And so she did a lot of very, very complicated genetics. And she found out that hummingbirds, unlike other birds, have a sweet taste receptor. And they've evolved that from a duplicate copy of the gene for tasting umami, which is the sort of taste you get from things like soy sauce. It's a savory flavor. And birds, all birds seem to have that taste receptor, but only hummingbirds have converted, have tweaked that gene to make a sweet receptor that's that taste sweet things. And so the next question is whether sunbirds, which have the same nectar feeding behavior, have evolved, independently evolved some, some other solution or the same solution to tasting sweet. Uh, this is Valchi, who is an Egyptian vulture and whom I used to love visiting in Kenya. And he's one of the first examples of tool use in birds. And, and again, this is an example of birds finding food. So what Egyptian vultures do is they break open ostrich eggs with stones. And vulture was one of the first examples of an animal behavior example of tool use, although we're much more familiar now with different corvids like crows being very, very clever with finding food and using cars to run over to open nuts for them and things like that. I also just put this up because it gets to my other point about birds as individuals and scientists starting to appreciate that and study that. And so here's another example where it's becoming very big in animal behavior to start looking at personality and to measure personality in different species. And so this is a study that found by measuring the personalities of individual elk as well as individual magpies, that the shyest elk seem to associate the most with the boldest magpies, whereas the opposite was not the case at all. And what the magpies are doing in this situation is picking ticks off the elk. And so the explanation for, for this pattern is that the boldest magpies are the ones that dare to actually prance around on the elk's back and look for ticks. And the shyest elk are a bit too obliging, and so they don't mind this. They, they actually quite like it. Whereas if you've got a, an elk with a very bold, brassy, pushy personality, it doesn't like having big birds pecking on its back. And so it chases them away. And similarly, the very shy magpies just don't go up to the elk. So there's this interesting individual variation in two species, as well as the relationship between two species. And again, on the theme of convergent evolution, we've got a similar dynamic going on with a completely different African group of species. Here we've got red-billed oxpeckers on an, Amer on an African buffalo, and they're picking ticks off as well. And we don't know about the personalities of either of these species because no one's done the study yet, but that would be interesting to look at. And here we've got a North American example. So these brown-headed cowbirds are not after the ticks on the American bison that they're sitting on, but they are interesting examples of birds that follow, they're called cowbirds because they would traditionally follow herds of bison and now herds of cows as well for the insects that they flash up. And they're convergent examples of this in Southern and Central America where birds will follow large swarms of army ants and, and pick off the insects that those army ants drive up as well. So there are lots of birds that take advantage of disturbances created by other species. The other reason I've got the cowbirds up here is they're what we call brood parasites. And that means that uh, similar to what those common megansers were doing to other females of the same species, these cowbirds parasitize the reproductive efforts of other birds. But in this case, they parasitize completely different species. So cowbirds and other birds that do this, like cuckoos, the common cuckoo of cuckoo, cock, cuckoo clock fame, don't have any of the instincts left to make a nest at all, and they don't incubate eggs, they don't do any of this parental behavior. All they do is find some other species nest in which to lay the eggs. And then they may monitor the nest, but they leave all the parental care to a different species. And this has become a big 
conservation problem in North America because the cowbirds expanded its range a lot since deforestation because of human development. And it's resulted in birds like this Kirtland's warbler from Michigan uh, having evolved zero defenses against a brood parasite like a cowbird. And they'll, they'll probably sit on a golf ball if you gave that to them in their nest. And as a result, these little birds have gone almost entirely, they, they came very close to going extinct for a short time, partly because of cowbird parasitism and partly because of uh, too much Smokey the Bear, and not enough young, small pines, jack pines that they prefer to nest in. So, so they've made a good comeback, but that was only after a lot of management efforts, both killing cowbirds and uh, doing a lot of management to get the trees to the right size that these birds like to nest in. On the brood parasite theme, these are, these are back to African birds that I studied. The cute green muppet ones are little bee-eater chicks and they've almost reached the point of fledging. And they're really sweet little birds, but they get very heavily parasitized by the the monster in the bottom right hand corner and that's a greater honey guy chick and it's this photo is taken probably just minutes or within a day of hatching and so that chick is still blind but you'll notice that it's got this really deadly looking bill hook on the end of its bill and these birds are also brood parasites and so if those little bee eaters had been parasitized by one of these great honey guides, they would all have been stabbed. All the eggs, or if there were any chicks, chicks would have been stabbed to death by, so that the great honey guide chick would be the only one in the nest and the only one getting parental care. So that's a very dark side of the species, but there's a more interesting, well, not more interesting, but more pleasant, lighter side of them as well which is that they're called greater honey guides because they guide people to honey. And this was first documented uh, in the scientific literature much earlier on by a Kenyan scientist, but it's been more recently studied in Mozambique. By, uh, um, and here's a photograph of one of those Mozambique honey hunters, Mozambican honey hunters with the greater honey guide. And that's a wild bird. So this is a fascinating relationship where you have a completely wild animal species that can communicate with humans and at quite a sophisticated level. So what the honey guide does is it finds a human and it sings a particular song to tell that human, to get that human's attention. And then it uses that call to indicate to the human where the honey is, where the beehives are, as well as how close the person is to the beehives. And it guides them it guides the humans to the beehives and what the bird gets out of this is they can't really they like eating wax a lot which is another fascinating adaptation we don't know much about but the humans are interested in the honey and so the humans basically help calm the bees with smoke and get the hive down and make the wax available to the birds and in return the birds have basically cut short the hunt for honey for the humans and so there's this very long old relationship which has been breaking down in a lot of parts of Africa with increased urbanization because the local people in a lot of parts of sub-Saharan Africa have stopped listening to the honey guides essentially. And it'd be really interesting to know the developmental stages of how a honey guide learns to find humans and communicate with them. And we don't really know this yet. There's also a lot of communication between birds. One of the examples I talk about that I've put here is of a Japanese tit, which is related to chickadees, black-capped chickadees that you'll be much more familiar with in North America. And all these birds have specific sounds, not just to signal alarm, but to signal danger, different types of danger. So they have a distinctly different alarm call for a snake or a crawling sort of predator versus a flying predator like a hawk and so this bird is a, take this photograph it, this is not my photograph but this Japanese tit is listening out for and looking out for danger because it's heard an alarm call and then my one of the last chapters is about migration and here's where I try to talk more about community science because there's a lot that 
we can do all the time just by submitting data on the birds we observe in terms of when they arrive at their breeding grounds or when they start arriving. And I'm sure a lot of you saw the news last week, I think, about a lot of migratory birds dropping dead. And we're not entirely sure why, but it could be that that's part of the result of all the forest fire smoke that the birds have inhaled. Um, but anyway, here, here's a photograph of white storks, the ones that were legendary for apparently delivering babies in Europe. And I've got that here because, well, everyone's attention is probably focused on the bird on the right, which has an African hunting spear through its neck. And this is the first documented example we know of in Europe that birds migrated. So before that, people thought in, in medieval Europe that barnacle geese turned into barnacles in winter, things like that. Uh, they weren't sure where, and the swallows ended up in the mud and were overwintered in the mud, which is actually quite a logical hypothesis. But this stork was shot down in Germany with an African hunting spear through its neck and so survived one, one hunter to be shot by another. But it's it was the first indication Europeans had that these birds actually came all the way from Africa. So they spent half their lives in a completely different place. And I just thought I'd end on snow geese, which is another of my favorite things to do in Montana, which is to see the huge flocks of snow geese come through the northern, the Rocky Mountain front in March and onto their way to breed in the Arctic. And we all know climate change is a huge problem that we should solve collectively. So I suppose one of my implicit pleas with these books is that the more people get interested in the natural world as well as in science, the more the better chance we stand of making good decisions about our future and trying to save the natural world or, or trying trying to keep as much of what we love alive as possible. And with that, I think I'll end and take questions, but I just wanted to encourage everyone to support the local bookshop. I know a couple of my friends here in Montana actually ordered the book from a local bookshop and got it before I did from the publishers. So there's a lot to be said for asking your local bookshop first rather than Amity. And there's some links that I put up in case you want to look at more pictures or you know, more photographs and more drawings.